doing it alone, you, you're the only one that's proud of yourself when if you do get some clean time. Also, when you're alone, you're not able to get encouragement or feedback from from other people. It's it's all about finding that first person to open up to. It could be a counselor. It could be someone anonymous online. If you find some kind of program online, it could be a close friend. Just you need to you have to start somewhere. So, Carmen, if you want to just give us a brief introduction of, of who you are, uh, a little bit about yourself that you want to share. From um, southwestern Pennsylvania, you know, I grew up in the Pittsburgh area and I've kind of been around this area all my life. And uh, I grew up in a really good, loving home. And um, I have a family of my own now. Uh, my wife and I, we have, you know, we have all boys. So I'm a, I'm a boy dad. So that makes things exciting. Um, I'm a bit of a, uh, a bit of a nerd on some things. I, I, I'm a Lego nerd. I love Marvel stuff and Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. And I currently work as a drug and alcohol counselor at a state prison here in Pennsylvania. And most of my career up until this point has been drug and alcohol and mental health related uh, the past 17 years, but the past 11 years, it's going to be 11 years in August that I've been in the state uh, prison working there. So, so 11 of those years has been in corrections. So that's been quite a change up from just the recovery side, you know. I love that you have that, that past in the career in the drug and alcohol field, working, working with people who have, you know, compulsions and addictions, because it ties in nicely to some of the experiences you've had and why you're a guest in today's podcast. So Let's kind of jump right into that topic of conversation. Uh, pornography has had an impact in your life. Can you can you explain to to our audience a little bit how pornography entered your life and the impact it's had? You know, early on in adolescent and teen years, um, you know, pornography wasn't nearly as prevalent as it as it is now, and you know, even in like the early two thousand. So I would say. Early on, you know, in like the the mid '90s, going into the early 2000s, you know, my, my experience with, with pornography was very few and far between because I didn't have access to it. You know, most of what me and my friends saw was just stuff on TV, or um, you know, maybe someone had a magazine, and that was more out of curiosity, and that was more, you know, that that wasn't so much like I don't know how to say like. Like I, I knew it was something that people looked at, but it actually wasn't till I would say I was 19 years old and it was, it was summer and I had looked at a something in my junk mail and it was something from a porn site. And I clicked on it just out of curiosity, just like, OK, this the name of this porn site is really stupid sounding. And like I, I kind of clicked on it to laugh at it because I thought it was. I thought it was stupid. I thought it was, I thought it was so above it and everything. And at that time, I, I didn't really like how pornography portrayed women. So I wasn't really looking for it, but just out of curiosity, I'd look at those emails and, you know, that gradually turned into me looking at it more often. And, um, and it was, it was kind of like the shock factor, you know, just looking at it because I, I didn't, I didn't pay for anything. You know, I, everything that I looked at was, quick little previews, maybe one, two minute previews. But in those previews, there's these quick, you know, split second snippets of different things and different angles and everything like that. And, um, and that kind of kept drawing me in um, because I, I believe porn, you know, they try to use shock factor to really draw you in. And so that's kind of how it really started to sink in, you know, with its claws in my life. Okay, so we we can almost classify that as like a, almost in like an accidental encounter with pornography, just a random email sent your box and a, a click of curiosity. So if you don't mind kind of explaining a little bit, when did you first realize that that curiosity crossed into a realm of, well, I, I might have a, an issue, I might have a compulsion, I might have an addiction? Like it took me a couple months, probably about six months or so to realize like, hey, I keep looking at this sometimes just to look at it just because, oh, I'm alone, I might as well look at it, you know. So a lot of times boredom and curiosity, and I think it started to become a problem when like I realized I was looking at it even when I didn't feel like looking at it. Like I'm just 
look at it. And um, I was ashamed about it all the time. And I didn't, I didn't like how I felt like I was compromising my integrity. And I felt like a hypocrite because deep down, I, I didn't like, you know, what it was portraying. So without, you know, getting into, the, you know, details, uh, if you can, you know, remember back to the, the, you know, the time of your peak consumption, you know, it was really a strong part of your life or how it affected your daily routine. Yeah. I mean, it, it messes with your focus. Um, you find yourself, you know, sexualizing everything, you know, with most addictions, you know, something that we talk about in the material, you know, at the, at the prison with the drug and alcohol program, we talk about preoccupation, which is a big part of addiction itself. And it's preoccupation happens when you're not using whatever the, you know, the, the habit is and, and you're just thinking, okay, well, when's the next time I'm going to look at it? Or, you know, you're always kind of, you're distracted, you know? So I, I would say it really affected me there. And the fact that I was working in recovery, I felt very hypocrite, you know, hip hypocritical about that because I thought, wow, I'm, you know, I'm trying to help these people with, their recovery and their addiction and here i am i'm struggling with my my stuff and i'm not applying these things that i'm learning um that i'm trying to teach these guys so uh, i didn't like how hypocritical i felt at first i didn't share it with anybody because most guys most of my friends you know they most guys my age were obsessed with pornography you know so you didn't dare talk about it as if it was a struggle you know so most guys that i heard just made it sound like oh yeah i look at that too or you know um but i, I really couldn't i couldn't find anyone to open up to i mean there might have been some people some guys at my church and i would get different responses from people some guys would say oh yeah that's me too you know i you know that's just part of being a guy or other guys would say, yeah, I got to quit doing that too. I'm ashamed of that. And, and then of course the, the other response I'd get at the other end of the spectrum was, Hey, you need to stop that right now. Like that's wrong. You need to stop. So, but if you think about those three responses, it's not like no one's giving you an answer, you know, how to stop. And so I felt like, okay, I get it. Okay. This is wrong. I need to stop. Um, I, I can't find anybody who's opening up about how they stop, you know, I knew shame didn't work, you know, shaming me into it. Um, and I would say, I think something that kept me from thinking that I had a problem was I used to think that someone who was addicted to pornography was, you know, a loner who lived in their basement, who watched it for hours on end. So I think that caused me to minimize things just a little bit because I, I definitely wasn't doing that. You know, so maybe I'm just this casual user kind of a person. And uh, one of the things I did because I couldn't find a, a good outlet, I I actually made this shirt in college. I just used a, a white T-shirt and a black marker and I, I put, you know, porn hurts women. And that was it. And I wore that because like. I, I guess I thought that if I wore that, that would motivate me to remember not to watch porn you know mm -hmm. because i believed that statement so i'd wear that around and like people would be like what's that and, you know i'd have some people like oh no i appreciate you wearing that and everything um but it didn't have any long-term you know effect on me quitting that habit it just kind of helped me project it out there and it sometimes motivated me but it didn't do a long-term you know effect so you you mentioned a few times you know the 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 term shame and if if you can expound a little bit upon that, you said that shame didn't help you, you know, deal with the issue that you're having. If I if you wouldn't mind of talk a little bit about how shame, how it didn't help. I think because, you know, shame is something for me, it can kind of wake you up and sometimes it can get you motivated to like just do better next time. Mm -hmm. But if if you keep concentrating on shame, then it's kind of like self-pitying yourself and something that I've learned is that if I, if I stay in the shame cycle and if I pity myself, it's like, I'm telling myself now nah, you can't really change. You know, there's, there's nothing you can really do. You're going to struggle from time to time and you just gotta have to deal with it. And, um, it just makes you feel defeated and like, there's no hope. Yeah. 
I'm glad you used the the phrase shame cycle because that that perfectly sums up you know how it applies to pornography. You know people people feel bad about themselves and what they're doing, so they turn to pornography to get that temporary release that temporary fix and then they feel shame because of it and they feel bad because of it so they turn to porn and it's that that cyclical uh issue that that keeps them coming back so i appreciate you brought that up so i want to touch a little bit about your your profession as a counselor in the prison you know you're you're helping with these prisoners deal with their addictions and their their life issues at the same time you're you're dealing with some pretty serious issues of your own uh, how did you compartmentalize that? How did you separate the prisoners, you know, addictions and compulsions between your own? Okay. Yeah, the only separation I saw was that, okay, these people with drug addiction and alcohol addiction, they were dealing with different consequences. You know, their addiction was taking them to rehabs, taking them to prisons, taking them to hospitals, um, affecting them financially. My porn habit wasn't affecting any of those things. I was of age, so I wasn't going to get in legal trouble for looking at pornography. Um, I wasn't spending money on it, so it wasn't hurting me financially. It's, it wasn't anything that was putting me in the hospital. Uh, There's no risk of overdose, you know. So I think that was the only separation. I, I still felt like I was a hypocrite and, and felt guilty and shame, but, and I was grateful I wasn't dealing with those consequences, but I thought, man, these, these other people were, they got so many other things stacked against them to motivate them, you know? And I thought like, well, you know, my whole world's not completely falling apart. So, um, I didn't have much hope about it, but, uh, still felt like a hypocrite anyway. Well, let's, let's go on the other side then, uh, the process of recovery, you know, how did that process start for you? When did that first start to take effect in your life? So that was about, I would say, I think it was at the, it was in the middle or end of 2014. I was, I started going to counseling about a couple things. And of course I brought, you know, the porn habit up in counseling and I just went full bore. I, I kept going to counseling uh, regularly. I started attending this meeting called a celebrate recovery meeting, which some people have heard of you know, it's, a, it's like a faith-based uh, recovery program. And I did everything they said. I got the sponsor. I got the books. I, uh, for clean time, I collected the tokens. I was like, okay, I'm going to do all these things <laughs> that I see drug addict, you know, recovering drug and alcohol uh, addicts do. And I'm going to go through the motions and be sincere and do every bit of it. And when I did it, I actually started to experience freedom. And it really felt like a miracle because for so long, I thought, I thought those programs were just for people with substance, you know, issues. Um, I didn't think it was going to really resonate and, and help me move forward. And I, I just couldn't believe that I was actually getting free. I was, I didn't mind, you know, opening up to my sponsor, going to the meetings. I looked forward to getting those tokens because you get a one month, two, three, and then six, nine and then a year and those were just I, because i was struggling by myself for so long it was such a blessing to see my progress and have other people like be proud of me too because i tried to you know quit on my own terms all the time so actually working a program made that huge difference because before when I was struggling, I might get a couple months clean. I'd feel proud, but I didn't have anybody to tell because I was still keeping it a secret, you know, and that made a huge difference. So that's what the beginning of my recovery looked like. And I was able to, I think I got about 19 months clean. So it was like the summer of 2016. I, I was away with some friends. I was out of town and I, I think I was feeling a little overconfident and I didn't really prepare. Like I didn't, um, I didn't take a lot of precautionary things I could have. I think I felt like, Oh, I'm good. You know, you want to feel that way because there's that temptation with addiction that you want to feel like you've arrived, you know, but when it comes to recovery, you, you'd still take each day at a time. So I went on this trip and before you knew it, I was relapsing on the way down. Like you'd think I'd wait till, I was at the hotel and I had the free Wi-Fi right there. It's like, 
And I hated how it ruined that weekend for me. You know, I still, I still had fun with my friends. We were on the beach and everything. And, and, uh, but I, man, I was like, I can't believe, you know, I, I just like, I blew this up. And I think one of the problems that I didn't see sneaking up on me was I was putting so much stock in that consecutive clean time that I felt like that was the sum of the success. So when I actually relapsed, I thought, Oh, I, I feel like I blew everything up. You know, like I'm back at square one when really you're not back at square one. If you pick up and, you know, you get back accountable again and you stay honest and, and you take that time to reflect on where you went wrong. Um, I didn't do that. I, I, I think I was, I had a lot of pride and I, I really just wanted that consecutive clean time. I felt like that was everything. And I wanted total freedom. So what happened in 2016 for that next couple of years, it's like, I kind of kept slipping every once in a while. I, st I stayed honest with my support system and everything, but uh, I kind of accepted in my mind. I was, I was like, okay, it's, it's still a problem. For those next three years, um, you know, I just, I kind of wavered. I just, I had months of clean time. I'd screw up, stay accountable and stuff, but I didn't have that full, like, okay, I can do this anymore, you know. You, you talked about for years, you you did it alone, or try, rather you tried to do it alone. And it wasn't until you found a group or a counselor or, or someone that you were able to confine in, find that accountability partner if you can talk to or speak to people who are struggling, currently struggling with pornography, who may be listening to this, who are trying to do it on their own, uh, can you expand a little bit about, you know, the challenges that has versus having, you know, say an accountability partner or someone who's experienced in the process of, of overcoming an addiction or a compulsion? Like I said, doing it alone, you're, you're the only one that's proud of yourself when, if you do get some clean time. Yeah. Um, also, when you're alone, you're not able to, get encouragement or feedback from, from other people. Um, you know, that was something solid about having a sponsor was that like, I could call this guy and, you know, we had similar values. Actually my sponsor, he was someone who had struggled with alcohol addiction, uh, which, but he was open to being my sponsor, you know, because we had the same, you know, uh, a lot of spiritual beliefs and everything, but it's, it's all about finding that first person to open up to. It could be a counselor. It could be someone anonymous online. If you find some kind of program online, it could be a close friend. Just you need to, you have to start somewhere, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's making me think of Mr. Rogers <laughs> because he, he said something in, I can't remember if it was in the movie or the documentary that came out, but he said, you know, any, any feeling that is mentionable is manageable. So if shame and guilt are saturated in my heart and in my mind, I can't start processing that until I get it out. Because when I put things in the words, then I can start seeing how better, how much better I feel that I got it out. You know, just having someone else who knows the crap you're dealing with, uh, it it makes you feel less alone. And that's that's like I swear the first half of the battle is not feeling alone. And when you feel like you can open up to someone who is not going to judge you and just listen to you, it's like you, you don't know how, how good you feel until you actually do it. It's kind of hard to describe. Like, I think the way I describe it is when I used to run cross country in high school, um, because I had a high metabolism, I didn't pay attention to, you know, how I was eating or how well I was hydrating, those kinds of things. So my freshman year, I didn't care. But then sophomore year, I was like, OK, I'm not going to eat Burger King the night before this huge uh, invitational tomorrow. And I'm going to make sure I hydrate properly. And it's like I didn't know how good I would feel until I actually tried those things, you know. So that's the best way I can describe it. I think that's fantastic. And I, that's why I really appreciate you know, individuals like you that are willing to come forward and share your story because it's through this process that the conversation is becoming normalized and it allows more and more people who have been silently struggling, keeping it to themselves to realize that there are more people out there just, just like them, you know, just like me, just like you, who are also struggling and who have struggled and have gone through some of the same things. And it, it helps them to, to have that, that path and that understanding that's already been, 
already been laid out and having that guide, you know, kind of help them along that path. You have, you've been very vocal, right? You know, with uh, talking about your, your recovery. So my, my first question is simply why, why are you so vocal about it? Why, why are you wanting to help people? Because after I had had that clean time from 2014 to 2016, I um, I was trying to find people to give my recovery back to, you know, because that is a part of recovery. You know, you, it's part of the steps that you are giving back your recovery by helping others. And I think one of the things that discouraged me was that I wasn't really finding many guys who were wanting to work on, you know, getting free and everything. And I kind of felt like my recovery was useless at that point because like with harm reduction, for instance, if you have multiple uh, issues you're struggling with, you're supposed to start with the most damaging. So at the recovery meetings I was go, going to, these people were, you know, struggling with alcohol, heroin and everything. And rightfully so, they should be addressing those things first. And every I found every time I opened up about the, the porn habit, it's kind of like, oh, Carmen's got this little mamby pamby habit. Everybody else has real habits that could kill them. You know, and I'd have guys like, oh, yeah, that's a struggle, too. And I'm like, dude, work on the quitting heroin stuff first, you know. Um, so I knew people wanted it, but I've always been someone in my life. I've always been someone who wants to help someone. And so because I couldn't find that pool of people, I kind of felt like it was my recovery was useless. So I think that's another reason why I gave up. Like no one cares. No one cares about a porn habit. It gets minimized or people laugh at you and everything. And it wasn't till that time between 2016 and 2018, there, there are three things that happened. Uh, the first thing was that I got involved in a, a local task force against human trafficking. That was always something I was passionate on fighting. And it was in those couple of years that I realized the strong connection porn and trafficking had because in my head they were two separate things. And so I joined that. And also I participated in this class at work called Impact of Crime. And it's a program that inmates voluntarily take uh, just to hear more stories from survivors and really learn to be more empathetic about their crimes and different types of abuse and things like that. And it's, it's one of the best programs we have, you know, in the prison. So learning about, you know, um, victims of sexual abuse and those kinds of things I learned there. And then the third thing was actually you guys, I came across fight the new drug. I saw something on Facebook and I was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Like they're, you know, they're getting people's stories and they're just talking about the harms of porn and up until that point, I had only heard people talking about porn in in the re, in the regard that like it's this moral failing, you know, and that's it. Um, I didn't hear these, hey, it's perpetuating sexual abuse, you know, um, it it fuels sex trafficking, uh, it fuels gender violence, and all these other things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is crazy. And at that point, like I said, in those three years, I was, I was wavering in my recovery and I hated how I felt going to these traffic, these, uh, trafficking task force meetings where they're talking about, yeah, there's, there's four main things we have to do to fight sexual exploitation. You know, we have to raise awareness. We have to, um, encourage legislation and, and laws, you know, have, have steeper sentencing. We need to have uh, shelters for women and children to go to, you know, for survivors and things like that. And I saw all three of those things happening. And the fourth thing is reducing demand. And at that point, I was really feeling convicted because I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I'm learning about how porn is fueling something like sex trafficking. And I still dabble in it. And I'm like, this is not congruent. Like this, I, I, how, how can I fight this over here and keep creating demand over here? So that really, that was like the extra layer that pushed me forward because I knew that I wanted to fight sex trafficking. 
you know, gr growing up, we learn about slavery in, uh, in the 1860s and everything with the civil war. And I remember in school thinking, wow, I'm glad say slavery is over, <laughs> you know? And then later in life, we hear about sex trafficking and it's like, it's not over. And to learn that I was helping it just by clicking things and just by searching things, it, it just brought that extra boost that I needed because I always wanted to be an activist for, for big, so, you know, social justice issues. So that's what really propelled me forward because I thought, you know, what if, what if I really started getting free again, not just for my own self-care and my own relationships, but what if I did it also because I don't just want to fight the sex trafficking and put guys in prison. I want to help men realize they don't have to be slaves to their sexual appetites and they can have sexual integrity. They don't have to be, you know, I, I don't like that whole like, oh, all, all men are just men, you know, all men are perverts. I don't like that. I don't identify as that. I, I'm, I don't like that every time I, if I walk down the street that a, a woman that I'm passing is like that much more afraid of me because, you know, I'm a stranger and she thinks just because I'm a guy, I'm going to do something like, I, I don't like that the women in our communities have to be on their guard so much. It's, um, it's just something that really bothers me. And so, it took me a while to, to come to that point to realize, wow, I can do something, you know, and that is kind of like the thing that pushed me forward to get back into my recovery. And, and like I said, I saw fight the new drug. They were, you guys were posting just like little excerpts of people's, um, people's stories. And I thought, man, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start sharing on my own, but I'm going to submit them my story, you know, and that's kind of how it really got started. I, I really appreciate that because you you have been one of the people that we've spoken here with Fight the New Drug that has really been able to share the idea that part of the recovery process is also helping other people along the way. And that's that's part of that process. And you've done such a great job in doing that and being very eloquent about it and being very, you know, well-spoken about it. And you've, you've helped a lot of people, even the, the video that we were able to produce with you, we've had so many positive comments and people reaching out to us, thanking us for your story. So I just wanted to, you know, on behalf of Fight the New Drug, thank you for, for that video. And thank you again for, you know, re, you know, retelling the story a little bit. So in, in your process of, of helping people through your, your social media accounts and through your podcast, is there a particular story or instance where it had an impact upon you personally? In my sharing, I would say I've had some people reach out to me uh, on Instagram just thanking me. Um, I've had guys open up to me and tell me, you know, I'm the first person they open up to about their uh, porn habit, I was able to encourage them. So that was really encouraging to me because it's almost like you can get, it's like you can get further with with strangers than you can with people in your own life. You know, cause uh, you know, the people, they, they don't know you, so they, they don't, they don't mind reaching out to you, but uh but also, if, if if you talk about this stuff in your own social media with your with your own family and friends and coworkers, they're like, "Okay, Carmen, calm down. We get it." You know. Uh, so it was nice to have people who were like, "Wow, tell me more. Like, how did you defeat this part? How did you get past this? And um, how did you get started? What do you mean you have this much time clean? How did you do that? You know." So that's been very rewarding to know that I'm I'm helping someone else. You know. Uh, because it it is it's not an easy topic, you know. I'm glad to know that I can be an encourager to people who are struggling to at least help them get started and uh, shed light on things that people have been so secretive about. Uh, the first way that I started to share on my social media was I would I would take like an excuse or a rationalization that I had used that enabled me to. Um, look at porn in the past and I would pair with it some type of counterpoint or some type of better rationale to come against that. You know, so if it was like, okay, well, as long as uh, I keep a secret, it's fine. And like the counterpoint would be like, 
yeah, but I would know. And that's too many people to know, <laughs> you know, or if, you know, one last look, you know, and then I'm good, you know, that'd be the excuse. And it's like the counterpoint is it's never the last look. Why would you think that you, you know, in your history, you know, uh, another one might be as long as I just look at, you know, soft pornography and not, you know, the more explicit stuff then I'm good. And it's like, no, because it's it, even if I stick to that successfully, I'm probably going to end up going to the, the more explicit stuff. But even in the meantime, I'm still preoccupied throughout the day. I'm distracted. I'm, you know, I'm feeling guilty. So, no, you know, and I think that's how we navigate ourselves out of denial is we confront every single excuse, rationalization, minimization, justification, come against every single one of those. And your self-talk gets better. What what are some of the things that you currently do in your life to help you in your in your recovery process to help you you know stay away from that the the pornography? I'd say it more has to do with me being aware of my emotions and my mental state because before it was like I felt like I was always being triggered by something and then I realized wait I'm not being triggered I'm just not handling depression well you know or I'm not handling anger well. Um, or, or anxiety. So I found that when I found the right coping mechanisms to pair with those emotions, mm. then it wasn't, those emotions were no longer automatic triggers. And also some of the other things I would do is I would be very, um, I stay very mindful of what I'm taking in throughout my day. So, you know, I'm not going to watch overly suggestive media if if it's a if it's during a time when I'm feeling depressed or if I'm feeling anxious or whatever, I'm gonna watch something wholesome, you know, if I'm gonna watch anything. Um, also just restricting myself on devices. You know, there were plenty of times where I'd be like, you know what? I'm not gonna be on my phone past like 8 30 tonight. All I need to know is the weather tomorrow. That's it. Phone down, done. Um, those sound like very simple things, but you'd be surprised how those little um, struck bits of structure and boundaries that you create just liberate you, you know, something as simple as not taking your phone to your, to the bathroom. When you go to the bathroom, that sounds very simple, but if you leaving the phone outside the bathroom and you go into the bathroom, uh, you, you have nothing to tempt you. It's not, you know, it's not right there. So there's a lot more practical things, um, that people can apply that, are actually a bit easier than you realize. And, and then, then I don't have to think about it, you know? So I noticed that when I'm more aware of my emotional state, um, if I'm aware of the the time of day and those types of things, and I take inventory of where I'm at, um, I'm more likely to be proactive with managing those emotions instead of waiting till I'm triggered or waiting till, you know, oh, I, like, like I shouldn't be just, doom scrolling on my phone just for no reason because i know that can lead to something so it's like you know what this needs to go down you know i need to get away i need to go breathe some fresh air go play with the dog go do something else so uh, it's been a, a great process of learning what coping mechanisms work what doesn't a lot of it's trial and error but uh once you realize what works then you know you you make it part of your plan I'm glad you talked about the small little steps, and I think that that's so important. An example that comes to mind is like the moon landing. We just didn't go to the moon one day. There were a lot of small little steps part of that process, and the same thing with you know pornography recovery. It's that's a that's a that's big, and it's it's difficult, and you know I, I think a lot of people don't understand how difficult it could be, and it's not the recovery. It's those small little steps, is and then you know it's that it's that mistake. Oh, I messed up continue those small little steps. Oh, I messed up. Continue those small little steps until you reach a point where that recovery is as a whole part of your life. I think a lot of the articles you guys have shown um, on the website and everything, I, I've read a lot of them, the ones about the brain. And, you know, so between those articles and, and the material we go over in the prison with, with the inmates, you know, it they talk about how in addiction, it takes the brain at least up to two years to get back to a place where you're not so instant gratification driven and everything. And I noticed that myself um, because this this second time that I got clean. So my 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 current recovery, uh, I call it my my uh, my clean date 
is actually June um, 10th of 2019. And, and what's crazy about that is that's actually the anniversary of the first like AA meeting or something like that. The, the two guys wow. that started alcohol. I didn't know that until afterwards. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've noticed how, how much it changes, how I, I don't feel so triggered. And that's why I think so many guys feel so hopeless at first because they can't imagine not feeling triggered by every single little thing. Well, when you start controlling what you're feeding your eyes, you know, and you start having some structure and accountability, it's, it's less on your mind. It does get better. It does get easier. You know, it's still challenging, but um, like the way I describe it to, um, to inmates when, when we're just talking about drugs and alcohol is that when it comes to cravings, like there's a difference between swatting a fly versus trying to get a bear out of your house, you know, whereas like, you know, the, the old urges and cravings, that's like the bear, you know, you get used to dealing with the bear and okay, maybe you should close your door and the bear won't come in. And it's like, wouldn't you rather be dealing with a fly every once in a while instead of a huge carnivorous animal, <laughs> you know, you know, the strength of your urges weaken over time. Yeah. I, I love that example. And as a father, I also think of my kids when they were young, learning to walk, walking was the hardest thing they, they could ever do, right? They were always following and stumbling, but now that they're older, they're running, they don't, they don't even think about walking anymore. It's just, they just do it. And I, I think pornography is similar to that, right? It's, it's really difficult. You're stumbling. It's, 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 you're encompassing your whole life trying to figure that out. But a year, two years down the line, you look back and you don't even think about it anymore. You're, you're just, you're just walking, you're running. Thank you again for everything you've said. Is there anything that, that we've missed or anything you want to share uh, with our listeners? Yeah. I, something I wanted to retouch on was, like I said, when I first started opening up about this, um, like I said, a lot of guys, because of the mixed reviews that you, you get when you open up, you know, I was really looking for like, Oh, here's a batch of guys who, who have gotten free or they want to get free, you know, something that I felt was kind of, um, I guess I would call it erroneous with, with a lot of the help I was trying to get at first was that like, you know, people don't, people don't acknowledge the injustice on the other side of what, of what you're doing, you know? And I think when people learn about those things, that can serve as a greater motivation for you. You know, um, I, I want, I want people to realize that when you are getting free of pornography, it's not just helping yourself, it's activism as, as well. And it becomes more rewarding. You know, I think with especially men, because we know men are, are, um, are the main consumers of pornography. I know more women have, but um, over time, but with men, I think men need to know that, look, you, you don't have to be a slave to your desires. You know, you can change the way you think about women. You know, if, if you keep thinking uh, that women are whatever porn or the world portrays them to be, if you keep thinking them as property, if you think of them as, uh, as objects, or inferior, um, then yeah, you're going to think you always deserve, you know, some type of sexual excitement, no matter what, you know, I, I feel like men don't realize how much entitlement we have when it comes to uh, sexual experiences from women. And something that I've noticed when I was talking about the impact of crime class with the inmates, um, what I noticed that, you know, these guys who they've been doing some time in prison and they're wanting to learn how to be more empathetic and everything like that. And the change that I see in these guys gives me hope for things like, you know, um, decreasing the, the demand in, in sex trafficking, because when men know that they can be invited to be part of a solution to something, many of them will rise to the occasion. And if you can pair with that, that there is hope that, you know, you can stop, um, you know, you can get rid of this porn habit or you can stop being so possessive with your sex life and things like that. When there's hope in that, I think that's like the perfect pairing because there's hope. And yeah, I'm I'm helping change the world. You quitting pornography and realizing who's getting hurt at the other end is is more powerful in changing the cycle and reducing the demand. Look, if you want to shift the whole culture and change for the next generation, tell your young men not to buy sex. 
stop normalizing pornography, you know, and those are the, the things that we can start doing now as authentic men. Every guy that I encounter in the prison, they all have at least one female in their life that they love, whether it's their mom, their girlfriend, their wife, their daughter, their niece. And if guys can start equating that to all women instead of, oh, I treat these women this way, but I treat these women that way, you know, there's authenticity there when you start treating all women with respect. Men need to decide if if they want to be an authentic man or not. What type of man do you want to be? Do you want to be a man who's the same on the inside, you know, that you are on the outside? Carmen, thank you so much. You, you've been so you've been so candid with your experiences, and I, I really appreciate it. On behalf of Fighting the Drug, thank you. And be, on behalf of our listeners, you've I think you're really speaking to an element which really needs to hear the story the way you've expressed it. So thank you. You have a great rest of the day. All right, you too. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Our annual Rep the Movement Day is on Friday, November 17th. Rep the Movement Day happens every year during our No Porn November campaign, and we encourage our fighters to rep the movement in one of our conversation starting tees so they can spread the awareness about the harms of pornography and show their support for this global cause. Don't have fighter gear yet? There's still time. Check out our No Porn November sale now at ftnd.org forward slash shop. That's ftnd.org forward slash shop. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. If you'd like to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. If you find this podcast helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a review. If this episode inspired you to consider giving up pornography, now is the perfect time. During No Porn November, we embolden our millions of fighters worldwide to encourage others to learn about the harms of pornography and to quit porn for 30 days to see the benefits of a life free of porn. Are you in? See how you can get involved in changing the conversation about pornography all month long at ftnd.org forward slash npn. That's ftnd.org forward slash npn. It's the best time of year to shop at the Fight the New Drug online store during our annual No Porn November sale, happening all month long. Get up to 70% off all our conversation starting gear, including new items released just this month. It's the perfect time to stock up on your favorite fighter gear. Plus, when you shop, 100% of the proceeds from your purchase support our mission to educate individuals on the harms of pornography and sexual exploitation. Get your gear before it's gone. Shop the No Porn November sale now at ftnd.org forward slash shop. That's ftnd.org forward slash shop.